We are back on a Monday morning. Hope Easter was wonderful for you and I hope you felt renewed. If you have questions about the church, about baptism, about how to follow Jesus, send them in, patrick at rsafeharbor.com. And remember to subscribe, if you would, please. Uh, it helps us tremendously. Ring the wee bell there uh, and spread this around. And thank you for all of you who've been incredibly generous in giving. That allows us to do this. It allows me to feed my wife and give us a place to live and the story of Jesus to go out to 21, 22 countries right now, which is amazing. Thank you. Uh, we took a break telling the story of Count Van uh, Tischendorf and his finding of the scriptures. Uh, and then two weeks on the resurrection. So let's just really quick review. Uh, in the 1840s, <clears throat> this genius named Tichendorf noticed that when he heard scripture being read in worship, most people didn't have their own books by, in the 1840s, although they were available. When he heard it read, it was, there was such an amazing number of variants in the way that the reading came that he was very concerned. In fact, he used the term horrified once. He would use that again. He seemed to like the word. He then decided he had to go find the, um, the, the original manuscripts. Spoiler alert, we don't have an original manuscript, but he did find some exceptionally old ones, older than any we'd ever found before. In this monastery at uh, St. Catherine's in North Africa, very hard to get to. In fact, it doesn't have a front door. To enter, you had to get into a basket and they pulled you up but you also had to convince them to pull you up. The monks weren't there for people to come by. It has become a touristy thing, <clears throat> not like Disneyland, but tour groups do go there now and in modern times, and the monks have relaxed many rules for that, but this is a different world. He kept asking if he could see their old books and they couldn't figure out why in a world he'd be interested in finding old Bible pages. To them, the Bible had brought them to Jesus, and now they'd, they spent their entire life adoring the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Mother of Christ. That's who they, that's who they followed, and that's, that's the way they lived their life, because that was the Bible's job. They did not feel it was important to find those other manuscripts, or even to care for them. So Tichendorf was, you got it, horrified when he found some of these sheets in baskets that were being used to light the fires. And when he pulled them out, realized he was holding the oldest then yet found version of scripture. They used it to, to uh, put in walls, cracks, to chink the cracks so that the, uh, uh, the wind wouldn't come through. He found them used as wallpaper. He found that many of them had th been thrown away. And so he used, <clears throat> He used trickery, chicanery, bribery. He lied, he stole, he did everything he could to get as much out as he could, sneaking it out. And he made a few trips. They got on to him and they, many still in history look upon him as a villain to people who wanted to see what the New Testament looked like in its most ancient form to date they looked upon him as a hero. So a very complicated thing. But he had certain rules as he laid out all of these different variants. The text is only to be sought from ancient evidence, especially from Greek manuscripts, but without neglecting the versions and testimonies of the fathers. In other words, if there's a doubt, use the oldest version. Uh, and then pay attention to what tradition and earliest scholars have said about this. A reading altogether peculiar to one or another ancient document is suspicious. Just means if you only find a variant once, it's probably not what the original said. Uh, the more often you find it, the more you have to question. Readings are to be rejected when it is probable that they came from copyists. Now we find that in our modern Bibles. Every so often you'll find something like, behold, or he said this because of, and those things were probably margin notes made by copyist monks, whoever did it, that eventually worked their way into the text. Doesn't hurt the Bible, doesn't bother our salvation, but Tischendorf was on the lookout for those and he would strip those out. Um, he, uh, again, he had all of these different rules and you can look up 
Tischendorf if you'd like and see what he had to say on this. But he was a genius, even though uh, you absolutely have every right to uh, blame him, accuse him of doing a lot of wrong to get the manuscripts. Once he had them, he was an exceptional scholar and did amazing work. He really saved a lot, our, our view of the New Testament because by that time, all they had were versions in Latin from Jerome, and then later uh, there were the Bishop's Bible and then the King James Bible, but all these were based upon manuscripts that weren't all that old. And by that time, a lot of tinkering had occurred with them. I brought up um, some time ago that King James himself had them change some things in the New Testament because he didn't like, for example, immersion, so he had them do a transliteration. He called it baptize because he didn't, their church didn't immerse and he wasn't going to do that. He had them slip in Easter for a Passover that most King James versions have been um, re-edited and revised more than 20 times. So when people run around yelling King James only, my first question is which one? Uh, because they, they were radically changed. He also put in other things like deacon instead of minister because there was an office of deacon in his church and he wanted that in the Bible. So what Tischendorf was trying to do was let's just get rid of all that. Let's scrape the barnacles off the ship and find what the scripture was really like. Now, one of the scriptures that he found translations of and one that we refer to a lot in sermons or in books about the Bible is something called the Septuagint. It refers to a, a, a Greek translation of the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament. It was Paul's favorite version. He quoted from it more often than any other version of the Old Testament. But what you might not know about the Septuagint is this. It was said in a story, undocumented, not backed up, a story that there were 72 Jewish scholars, hence the name Septuagint, 70. They um, told me put 72 of these scholars in 72 rooms with copies, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, without copies of scripture and told them to translate scripture into Greek from memory because they knew all of these scriptures in their heart. When they were done, all 72 were compared and they were perfectly in agreement with each other. The story is not true. It cannot be true. You, you can't get two people to write an entire book, much less all of those books of the Old Testament to, and not have a single variant. It was, it, was a, it was a righteous myth told to get people to, to trust the scripture. And by the way, I think the Septuagint's a, a, a great, great translation. Uh, Paul, if Paul liked it, there are, there are parts of it that we don't hold to it now, but we'll get to that. We, we got time. This showed up around 323 BC. So it had been in wide use by the time Jesus was born for 300 years. It was eventually translated into a more modern Greek in the year 600, so that's AD. Uh, and so Jewish scholars, however, to this day, reject the newer translation. In fact, many of them reject the Septuagint in total. They look upon it as a Christianized version of their Bible. They prefer the Masoretic text of scriptures, believing Hebrew has an intrinsic holiness in its sound. That is not unusual, by the way. Um, there are some scriptures that were only written in, in Coptic or in Gothic, or there are scriptures that were written in Sanskrit. Um, the, um, the Muslims believe that their Quran has to be in Arabic, that any translation of that defiles it. And so they memorize it in Arabic. Even non-memorizing, uh, non-Arab speaking people will memorize the sounds, inflections, and meter because it's considered that language is a holy language. The Jews feel like uh, Hebrew was more holy, so they kept the Masoretic text and it was to be there forever. Um, when we look at the manuscripts though, we see some issues. Uh, the different translators of different books used different ways. I mean, they, they vary widely in skill 
linguistic skill, many of the books in the Septuagint never, never made it to our Bibles. Some of them were never considered scripture by the Jews. So one wonders why they got in there. Well, they were looked upon as important books, uh, books that were part of the culture, but they were not considered scripture. The Septuagint is, in other words, a collection of holy works. It is not a translation or pouring out from the heart of the Torah. It is a collection of sacred books. The Septuagint that we know today comes from 600 AD. It is not the same as the one Jesus knew or that Paul was quoting back in their time. Origen, a saint and scholar from North Africa, gathered all the Hebrew scriptures he could find and he compared them with all the Greek ones he could find. And he wrote a column by column, I mean, what a job, line by line breakdown of the variant readings, tracing which re reading was more likely to have come from which source. Here's the heartbreaking aspect of this. That work is lost. We know it happened. We know it was copied extensively. We know in private letters that it was very useful, that people took this and, uh, and used it to make their own versions in their own languages, and we don't have the original. And that's um, it's really sad. It's rather like, um, what would happen if we did not have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but rather a scholar like Origen were to, was to blend them together, working the variants into one cohesive story, this massive work. And so all we have is the harmony of the gospels. We've lost Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's kind of what happened with Origen's work. Variant readings number in the thousands, but they're unknown to most of us, but it gives us real questions. Whenever somebody stands up and says, every single word in the Bible is breathed from the mouth of God, we have to wonder, well, the ones in the variants we printed, but not those? And that becomes a problem. It really does. If you look at the Bible as our story of faith, the interaction of man and God, him bringing us to Jesus, and then filling us with the Holy Spirit, telling us to do good, to love God, love each other as our neighbor, and to move forward, spreading the, the news of grace, love, peace, and joy, then we can deal with this. But if our Bible is our avatar, our perfect human, perfect physical, rather, manifestation of a perfect God, then we have problems because the variant readings do number in the thousands. By the way, I like Bart Ehrman and I like his books, but he writes you know, lost gospels and um, uh, misquoting Jesus. And it's always over a variant that really doesn't make a bit of difference. And so the variants are there, but we shrug our shoulders. We know they're there. Doesn't bother us. Some scriptures of ancient origin are found in the Septuagint, but they're not in the Masoretic, which means ancient Jewish books exist in Greek in the Septuagint, but by the 600 AD mark, and well before with the Masoretic text, the Jews weren't accepting. Uh, we're going to look at that eventually. Maybe by this summer, we'll be able to go and look at the Apocrypha. Uh, the, there are deuterocanonical books. There are, um, I can't even pronounce the word today. There are books written in between the Old and New Testament. We'll look at those. These, they would include Tobit, Judah, Wisdom of Solomon, Wisdom of Jesus, son of Sirach, Baruch, the letter of Jeremiah, which later became chapter six in Baruch. This is not easy to follow, I get that. And then a lot of additions to Daniel. Uh, people felt really comfortable adding to Daniel. The prayer of Azarias, the song of three children, Shoshana and Bella and the dragon. Additions to Esther, uh, and then you have books, first Maccabees, second Maccabees, third Maccabees, fourth Maccabees, first Esdras, a book called The Odes, another one called The Prayer of Manasseh, The Psalms of Solomon, and Psalm 151. The, to this day, it, it, it's really according to which culture and nation you are in as to which books are in your Bible. Because some of these are in some Bibles, some of them are not. Some Bibles do have 151 Psalms. Some do have the additions uh, to Daniel. Some do have 1st and 2nd Maccabees 
Fewer have third and fourth Maccabees. We'll, we'll talk about that another day. You're sometimes told, in other words, that a group of men gathered in a room and decided these are the books that they're in and these are the books that are not. It's just not true. Now, there is some truth in it, but it's still the general tone is inaccurate. For a while, there was never the big drive to consider a need to establish these are the holy books and these are just books we really, really like that are very important to us. You know, a, a Christian might, according, and I'm, I'm going to mess this up, I'm sure. A Christian might say, these are the Bible, you know, these books are the Bible books. These are the holy ones from God. But these get me through my day. You know, Chuck Swindoll, Max Lucado, you know, these books are the ones that show me how to apply. And these are really holy to me. You know, if it was me, that there, there are some books that if you tried to take C.S. Lewis away from me, you would have to drag me behind your car as I'm holding onto the bumper. Do I believe that C.S. Lewis was, um, uh, his books are equal to scripture? Absolutely not. No. But you get to drift, holy enough to keep. But there was no big drive to separate those two into distinct piles until about 70 AD, when a group of rabbis declared that the Jewish scriptures were closed. There would be no more books in what we call the Old Testament, they call the scriptures. That was mainly to keep Christian literature from sneaking into their books because people were, Christians were, looking at the Old Testament and seeing the many prophecies about Jesus, they, they are legitimately there, that he absolutely did fulfill. And so when they retranslated the scriptures, they would, they would bend words a little bit to make sure that the pointers to Christ were a little bit more obvious. And the Jewish rabbis, um, I think very understandably, said, leave our stuff alone, the scriptures are closed. Well, Christians passed around books, but they didn't form a canon, C-A-N-O-N. It comes from a word meaning a rule, like a measuring stick or a standard. And they, they didn't form a canon for nearly 300 years. Books written by apostles were considered most important, so much so that forgeries did abound. Some of these forgeries were really forgeries. They were written to make money, to cause trouble. Uh, Paul refers to uh, some of that in Philippians chapter 1, but he also refers to forgeries in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 17. There were people doing, but there was another form here that really we don't get, but would have been very, very common to them. And that is to say, you know, I, Paul, an apostle of Christ, am writing this, when you're not Paul, but you're writing in his style. You are writing things he said or would have said in different situations. And that was not considered, it, it was not plagiarism, it was not considered fraud because you were writing in the school of. And this was very common, which makes it a real headache. Whenever you take a look at First and Second Timothy, for example, which are radically different in their Greek, their word usage. Um, and so you have to decide, is this because Paul's in greater distress or is it that Paul didn't write one or both of these? And by the way, every one of them's in doubt with some scholar. I don't have a problem with them being from God. So I get it though. I, I do get their point. Second Peter, it's really hard to find a scholar today outside of very fundamentalist circles that believes Peter wrote it. But we still think it's scripture. It was written by somebody in Peter's style. It was not considered a forgery. That is so hard for us to get, but for them, that's the way things worked. Then what drove us to start thinking, we better know what books are in our Bible and what books shouldn't be there. It all began with a bishop, a bishop who did something which frightened Christianity and made the rest of Christianity say, we better know the difference between our books and books that don't go in our canon. We'll talk about him next week. Have a blessed week.